Had, hadn't tried the soundboard since uh, I updated to iOS 8 on the iPad that I run it off of. And What uh, do you use for that? I heard you say that yesterday. It's, uh, I always forget the, uh, the company. It's called Soundboard. <laughs> okay. From, from the people of Soundboard, Soundboard. No, it's one of those. Uh, it's one of those companies that makes a bunch of apps for Mac and iOS. Oh. Like Rover and Rogan, maybe. They do a lot of sound stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, might be them. Eh, we can discuss it later. No, I must find Ambrosia. Ambrosia software. Ambrosia. There we go. <laughs> the other ones. Exactly. Uh, all right. You ready to do a show? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I'm ready. Here we go. The Daily Tech News Show was brought to you today by me. If you would like to bring it to someone, visit patreon.com slash acedetect. That's patreon.com slash A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 18th, or possibly Friday, September 19th, if you live where our guest lives. I'm Tom Merritt, and joining me from Australia, where it is Friday morning, Peter Wells, editor of Reckoner Australia. Thanks again for getting up, Peter. It's great to have you along. No worries at all, Tom. It's a, it's a beautiful morning down here. It's iPhone day for you already. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, as, as I look around my Twitter feed, there's uh, quite a few people already lined up uh, in front of the major Apple stores and even some of the tiny ones. So, uh, yeah, like it, the, the very smaller Apple stores still are reporting about three or 400 people at the front. So I don't know what's happening. I, I didn't expect the iPhone 6 to be uh, this big, uh, but people are, people are loving it. Yeah, I guess it's been so long since they got excited about an iPhone that they decided to just get excited about an iPhone. And they, and it's not like Apple disappointed them with a really crappy one. It's a good phone, right? So Yeah, it's very, very sexy looking. I, I like the fact that they've gone back to the kind of curved uh, feel of this thing because um, yeah, the, the last couple of revisions, the 4 and the 5, uh, felt a little bit kind of hard in the hand. That, that, that chamfered edge actually... Mm. I, I found I always had to wear, you know, use a, a case just to make it feel a little bit more comfortable. So, yeah, looking forward to this one. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about Tim Cook and his new privacy policy for iOS 8 in a little bit, but let's start off with some headlines. Uh, and breaking news, right before we started the show, Bloomberg reporting Larry Ellison intends to step down as CEO of Oracle and hand over the CEO duties to President Mark Hurd and President and CFO Safra Katz. They are very carefully not calling them co-CEOs, lest they invoke the spirit <laughs> of BlackBerry, uh, but they will both be CEOs. Ellison will become chairman, replacing Jeff Henley, who becomes vice chairman, and Ellison will take on the title of chief technology officer, so he's not leaving the company. He's kind of pulling a Bill Gates here and stepping mm. away from the, the chief executive role, but, but staying on in some capacity. No, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, Ellison co-founded Oracle in 1977, if you didn't know that. He, he's been with it since the beginning. Even back then, it was called Software Development Laboratories. Yeah, real end of an era stuff here. I mean, uh, is he the last of, of that, that generation to, to finally step down? That's a good question. Uh, does Bezos hail from that generation or not? He kind of straddles it. I mean, he came along in the mid-90s, really, so he's a, he's a little bit later. Certainly, Ellison is one of the earliest part of that generation in the 70s, along with Gates, Jobs. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess of the big, of the real giant ones, I mean, I, I know there's others from that generation still sticking around, but, yeah, he is, you're right. He's, he's kind of the, the, the tallest of that generation that had been left in charge. Indeed. I mean, he's a very tall man, is what I'm trying to say. He's mm-hmm. got to gotta look up. Also, he owns an island. And yes, again, indeed. Really big <laughs> uh, Amazon announced a revamp to its Kindle lineup yesterday. Here's the list. The Fire HD now comes in two sizes, a 6-inch version for 99 bucks and a 7-inch version for 139 bucks, both shipping next month. For $50 extra, you can make those into kids' editions, which include a free year of the kid-friendly Amazon Free Time Unlimited. That's apps and games and all kinds of stuff. A big, durable case uh, that the kids won't be able to break very easily. And a two-year, no-questions-asked warranty. I think that's the most appealing to parents. The HDX 8.9 got a faster processor and the addition of Fire fly, among other things. The entry-level e-ink Kindle stays at 79 bucks, but it gets a touchscreen now and more memory starting in October. Amazon also announced Family Library that lets you share books, audiobooks, Prime Instant videos, 
but not TV, movie, and music, apps and games among all your family members. So it's similar to family sharing from Apple. But the star of the show was the Kindle Voyage. That's what has all the reporters salivating. The screen is e-ink, but it's 300 PPI, 300 pixels per inch, so apparently it's gorgeous. It also has a higher contrast than even the paper white, so it's paper whitier than the paper white. Uh, has ambient light settings that adjust gradually. So that your eye, as your eyes dilate in a dark room, the lighting dims slowly so it doesn't uh, shock you. Uh, has a flush glass screen, though it's not glossy or reflective, and a function that lets you squeeze either the right or left bezels to turn pages so you don't even have to move your fingers. Kindle Void ships in October for $199 for the Wi-Fi version or $269 for a 3G-enabled version. Ah, oh, that Voyage looks sexy. Uh, I... I don't know if I'm going to buy one, though. I mean, I, I only ever seem to pull out my Kindle when I'm on holiday, which is very rare, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, my, my Kindles tend to last a hell of a long time. But, God, yeah, that uh, that flush screen looks amazing. And, and yeah, the ambient light thing is very cool, too, because I, I do find uh, having to turn down the Kindle when I'm in bed. I would like to have that ambient light feature on all of my devices, frankly. Mm. That, that sounds amazing. That's the thing that I think attracted me the most uh, to the Voyage the the bezel thing is nifty. I don't find it terribly. I don't even notice that I'm flicking. And I I read my Kindle books mostly on the Nexus Seven, uh, because it's lightweight, fits in my hand easy, and I can use it for other things. I can look at my RSS feeds. I can check my email and all of that sort of thing, which I could do with a Kindle Fire too. But I just the Nexus Seven is light lighter than that. Of course, these new Fire HDs will be lighter as well. Uh, it's certainly not a bad move here among Amazon. And if you are one of the e ink folks, there's a lot of people who are like no, I don't want to read on a tablet. I want to read on e ink. I think the Voyage is super compelling for them. Yeah, and, and uh, I do think the Fire HDs are, are actually quite pretty looking as well. I mean, there's, there's some charm to that uh, candy color backing that they have, and, and I really love the idea of the, the kid-friendly tablet. Um, I've got a friend who's who's got this iPad in this ridiculous kind of gigantic case so that his two-year-old uh, can't destroy it. His his two-year-old has destroyed two iPads so far. So, um, yeah, it's uh, this is a very smart move. Yeah, no, I, I think they, I think that kid-friendly uh, version of the of the Fire HD is is brilliant. So for fifty bucks, which is not cheap, you get a two-year no questions asked warranty. I think that right there makes it worth it. Plus they throw in a a hardened case to help mm. out. I think that's smart. Apple posted a new privacy policy uh, as well as a whole subsite on privacy at apple.com slash privacy explaining changes in iOS 8 as well as pre-existing privacy protections that already they already had. Subsite has sections on privacy design, privacy management, and government requests. In an introductory letter to the site, CEO Tim Cook says Apple has never put backdoors in their products for the government, and he says they never will. The site also claims that most of your data is now encrypted on your iOS devices with your passcode and cannot be recovered by Apple even if they wanted to. Peter and I are going to talk quite a bit more about this here in a few minutes. ZDNet's Mary Jo Foley reports Microsoft conducted its second round of layoffs Thursday, letting go 2,100 people. Microsoft let go 13,000 back in July, if you remember. That's of a total of 18,000 they intend to cut, so they still have 2,900 more to go before July 2015. 747 of this current round of 2,100 were in Washington State, with the rest distributed globally. The Verge reports that the Samsung Galaxy Note 4 goes on sale in the United States October 17th. If you live in the UK, it will go on sale October 10th. Pre-orders begin tomorrow in both countries. On the carrier side, AT&T announced it will ship the Note 4 beginning October 14th, so you get a little earlier, for 300 bucks on contract and $825.99 for the unsubsidized contract-free version. You can also pay for the phone in monthly installments of $34.42 over 18 months or $41.30 over 12 months. If you want a Note 4 from T-Mobile, you'll have to wait until September 24th to pre-order, but it will still arrive on October 17th, and you can have up to 24 months to pay it off. Verizon and Sprint ask you to please hold. They will get right back to you about their Note 4 availability. Your interest is very important to them, though. I'm, fr I'm fairly certain. <laughs> yeah, you've got to give it to the uh, the Note line for, for a really, you know, being the granddaddy of these these phablet phones, I mean, we're seeing people line up for the iPhone 6 Plus at the moment. Um, that many many Apple people would have mocked a phone that big just a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, good on the note. Uh, have you have you played with one? Do you yeah, find the, I have. How do you find the pen? 
Uh, you know, it's funny. Darren Kitchen used a note. I don't know if he still does, but he used a note with the pen, uh, and he loved it. And I could see the advantage, especially if you're like, you know what, on the go, I need an easy way to, to get into terminal and do a little remote management, and I want that bigger screen. Uh, it was essential. Now, it's, I think we've lost the division. I don't think the phablet term means much to me anymore. When you've got a six-inch Kindle tablet and a mm. six-inch and six-inch phones. Uh, it's just sort of like, well, you know, what size of a thing do you need? Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's almost arbitrary that the smaller ones have phone capability in them and the tablets don't. Especially now that you can, uh, you know, take uh, calls and make calls on, a, on an iPad if you're running iOS 8 as well now. Yeah, the, right. the lines are getting blurred. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and if you use Skype and you've got, you know, the proper connection, you can, you can just have that be your phone. Gigaom reports Twilio will add MMS support for regular phone numbers. Speaking of using weird things as phones, uh, Twilio allows developers to embed multimedia messaging into apps, and this new function means that companies can use a single phone number for voice, text, and multimedia, similar to existing offers by companies like ZipWhip and Bandwidth. Uh, so no more short codes necessary. 800 numbers aren't supported for multimedia messaging right now, but they can do text messaging. So instead of having to know some weird short code, Peter, I could just, whatever the phone number is of the company I'm trying to talk with, I can text them and they can text me from that number. Among uh, this is, Yeah, this is very odd. <laughs> does, does this feel like a, a, pro, uh, you know, a problem that should have been solved a little while ago? Yeah, well, I think, it, I think back when everyone had landlines and few people had phones... It made sense to have the short code service, right? Where I could have one intern manage it because I wasn't going to have that much bulk. Now that everybody's got a cell phone, uh, in, in most parts of the world even, uh, that can at least do SMS, it makes sense to say, you know what, we need to be able to support this. And one interesting, in the GigaOM article, one interesting example they gave was a company where the customer service rep uses an app. Uh, they were using a personal shopper, I think, as an example to be able to take pictures and send messages out to their customers, whereas the customer just gets the text messages and responds as if they're doing a text-to-text -text situation. So that, that's the kind of thing that Twilio makes, makes possible here. Okay. Time now for some news from you. These are things submitted on our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. More than 3,000 people in there uh, having a good time submitting stories, voting on each other's stories. It's an essential signal that I look at among the many signals when I put the show together each day. And I like to highlight a few of the things uh, that people submit. Lots of stuff in the, in the earlier part of the headlines is submitted as well, and I appreciate those also. Habituela Condolce passes along another Ars Technica article about the ongoing debate over over what is considered broadband. Now, if you remember last week, AT&T and Verizon said that four megabits per second is sufficient for broadband. This week, US FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler told a congressional committee that four megabits per second is too slow and that internet service providers who accept government subsidies to connect rural areas should offer at least 10 megabits per second to avoid a digital divide between city and country internet users. Wheeler says he hopes to have that issue tidied up. That's a quote by the end of the year. Yeah, four megabits is far too small. Um, I'm, I'm actually, right now I'm on eight megabits and, and our ISP uh, has a little rule there if you drop behind eight, eight megabits, they'll actually send someone out to your house to test your line. No kidding. Uh, but yeah, but that's that's it. Um, and, and I kind of, can, I mean, even that is pretty, like I just get by. So we've had to turn down the bandwidth for today's conversation so that I'm not too choppy on your end. But um, yeah, it's, it's so, so annoying having to kind of work out that if I'm doing a podcast, that means uh, Netflix has to be off or no online gaming or, you know, that's, that's where the issue comes up in our house. Well, and four megabits per second was broadband back in 1999. I'll grant you that. Uh, but what we're able to do on the Internet and how we use it has changed drastically, especially with the advent of tablets and smartphones. We have so many more devices. We have game consoles that update themselves and, and our Rokus and Apple TVs, potentially. Uh, people are backing up, which they should be doing over the Internet quite, quite a lot more. Uh, so there's just, there's just more to do on the Internet. You need more bandwidth for that. It's funny that you say that the ISP will come out if you fall below 8 megabits per second. Because I think in the U.S. what ISPs do is if you're paying for 8 megabits per second and you get close to that, they, they make sure to throttle you back. <laughs> so you're slower. <laughs> well, that seems fair too. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Captain Kipper submitted the mobile syrup post that Microsoft has changed its developer fee to a lifetime subscription that you only have to pay once. One developer account serves for Windows or Windows Phone stores. That was already the case, but it's still the case. Developers were previously charged $19 annually for an individual account. Now they just have to pay once, and that's it. That also means existing accounts will not expire. So good on you, Microsoft. Very developer-friendly there, and they need to be doing that. Mm -hmm. And finally, Diggs a lot submitted a torrent free article stating that Simon Bush, CEO of the Australian Home Entertainment Distributors Association, says some of his members, who are Hollywood Studios, are lobbying Netflix to block users that connect through a VPN, Peter. Coincidentally, mm -hmm. an estimated 200,000 Australians are estimated to use the U.S. version of Netflix. And, as you pointed out to me before the show, QuickFlix CEO Stephen Langsford has renewed his calls for Netflix to block VPN users, accusing Netflix of profiting off, quote, backdoor tactics. Of course, banning VPN use of Netflix would probably affect non-Australian users with legitimate accounts as well. So thanks a lot, Peter, on behalf of <laughs> Australia. You going to hey, ruin this for all of us? Don't blame me, man. I've only just gotten onto Netflix. It's been two months now since Netflix <laughs> came into my life, and I'm not prepared to give it up, all right? They can take Netflix from my cold, dead router. I am not prepared to let this one go, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, at the moment I'm using a DNS service rather than a VPN service, so uh, it doesn't seem to be affected too much, and like you were saying, uh, that a lot of the plugins, uh, say, Hola uh, is, is the plugin that I use um, for Chrome as well, if I can't for whatever reason, I can't access my DNS server. Um, and, yeah, that, that seems to always be able to route around these issues when they pop up. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that it does end up punishing people who are doing things honestly. For instance, Hulu blocks VPN providers to try to combat this from happening. And when I go on vacation or I'm traveling for work. When I was in Dragon Con, for instance, in Atlanta, in a hotel, I'm using a VPN because I want to protect my data from any prying eyes on that hotel network. I couldn't watch Hulu because Hulu said, oh, we see you're using a VPN proxy, so not going to let you stream that till you turn that VPN off. I'm like, okay, so I should be insecure on the hotel Wi-Fi if I want to use your service. Screw you, I'm not going to use your service. Uh, but like you say, there's lots of other ways to get around this if you're really determined. Ask the people of Turkey, for instance, how they watched YouTube back when YouTube was being blocked for a while. DNS providers, other VPN providers. You're not really going to stop people. You're just going to end up punishing a lot of people who aren't doing anything wrong. Yeah, and I feel like it, it's come out of... Uh, we've just recently had um, a, a federal government uh, discussion on online piracy. Uh, and, yeah, the government actually, uh, you know, asked for content holders and ISPs to come together and submit how they thought they could tackle piracy in Australia. And people con continually said rights holders and uh, Village Roadshow, who were one of the kind of poster poster uh, fighters for, for content rights, uh, kept saying that people are using a VPN uh, to illegally download Netflix in this country. Um, which, I mean, there, there are many things wrong about that statement to begin with, but um, it, it's it's a bizarre thing, because like you said, yeah, this will only affect, really, I'd say, a lot of people who use VPNs in their proper way. Most of the people who use Netflix in Australia actually are using a DNS service, because it's uh, the DNS services are the most convenient if you're going to use, uh, say, Netflix on an Apple TV or a Chromecast or a Roku or any of those other set-top box type devices. So um, if you're nerdy enough to know how to set this thing up, then you're probably going to want it on a TV. You're probably going to want it on that device. So um, yeah, I, <laughs> unfortunately, they're actually coming after the wrong people. They're coming after VPN users who are generally, yeah, like you said, tr just trying to look after their privacy in, maybe in a hotel situation or an insecure Wi-Fi situation, but they're probably not going to affect me. Yeah, it's well. Remember, we used to yell torrents. Torrents are not a crime, uh, and and file sharing is not a crime. Now VPN is not a crime. In fact, it's important for people to use. This is this is not the way to fix this. The way to fix it is to launch Netflix in Australia, which apparently uh, you found an article that indicates they might be doing that. They got worldwide rights to Gotham, and according to smh.com.au. Part of those worldwide rights included Australia, even though they don't have an Australian version of Netflix yet. 
Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of talk again. Uh, if we look at uh, Village Roadshow, he actually uh, the the CEO of Village Roadshow actually kicked off this whole discussion because uh, he casually said to uh, SMH um, in in an interview that uh, that they were in talks with uh, Netflix for some of their old back catalogs. So um, yeah, Netflix is slowly getting outed by all these other content providers as uh, as definitely launching in Australia. But it's it's going to be it's going to be that issue of what Netflix can. Uh, hold on to in Australia because uh, Foxtel, the the kind of incumbent here is Foxtel, and they've they've uh, locked up the rights to Game of Thrones and a lot of those kind of marquee uh, TV shows. So it'll be really interesting to see how it all plays out and whether Netflix's own original content will be enough to to get people to switch and to maybe switch off their DNS or VPN service. Yeah, absolutely. And that, my friends, is a look at the headlines. Uh, just a quick reminder that I have a new novella out at TomEritBooks.com called Events of a Different Nature. It is a noir book about two private investigators. One used to be a secret agent, one a former gang member, and they're helping to keep their neighborhood clean. It's possible that those two investigators are dogs. You'll just have to read it to find out for sure. TomEritBooks.com if you're interested. There's a free version there as well as printed versions and book, uh, versions for various ebook platforms. TomEritBooks.com. All right, so we, uh, we mentioned this Apple privacy thing and Tim Cook coming out strong saying, you know, we are not going to hand over your data. Uh, this is a change. Uh, an older landing page claimed that Apple, with a warrant, could bypass the passcode in iOS to retrieve SMS, photos, videos, contacts, audio recording, and call history. That seems Ooh. to have changed. In iOS 8, they've extended encryption to more data, messages, mail, calendar, contacts, photos, user data protection by default, and third-party apps uh, receive this protection automatically. So if you have a passcode on your device, that passcode is only known to you, not to Apple, and nobody else can get around that unless they break the encryption. And Apple does some things to slow down brute force attacks. They encourage you to choose a complex and uh, hard to guess passcode. And that's why Touch ID exists so that you can choose that complex passcode and not have to remember it all the time. Uh, this is not going to be uh, entirely foolproof. Jonathan Jarsky has already noted that there's a way around it. Uh, if you've unlocked your phone once since you powered it on, and whoever wants to get at your data can get a hold of what's called a pairing record, either through malware or in your PC, or if they're the police, they just seize your PC. Uh, they can use that to get your third-party data, your photos, and your videos. But even then, that's all they can get with that pairing record. Uh, also, interestingly, Peter, before I get your feedback on this, there was something called a warrant canary in the 2013 transparency report from Apple. It said... Apple has never received an order under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. We would expect to challenge such an order if it was served on us. Gigom points out today, that's gone in the latest two reports. So some of this may be a reaction to Patriot Act requests. Yeah, yeah. The, the warrant canary thing was, was always interesting. I, li I like the fact that they kind of put that up there to say, look, we... We'll put up this uh, this block of text, and the day you see it gone is the day you know that we've been requested to give up information. Um, and yeah, so I I wouldn't be surprised if that's that's what kind of kicked this off. But also, obviously, uh, Apple has has issues with privacy, has issues with uh, security that they've they've got to um, they've got to address that 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 public. Um, kind of, I don't know, reticence uh, to the iCloud service uh, before they start trying to get you to use um, some of their other features of the iPhone 6, things like storing your, your credit cards, even though nerds will know that credit card details aren't uh, stored in iCloud, your average end user is probably not going to be aware of that. So they need to get on top of that. They need to change that discussion um, from your photos can suddenly be stolen and hacked to, to this. But, but I mean, I, I guess that's a whole different story to the discussion right now with the, the NSA and, uh, and, and these, these almost, it, it almost seems a little bit kind of uh, bullish on Apple's part to say, look, we're, we're changing this, we're changing this service so that we will still be able to do whatever you request of us, we just can't do what you request of us anymore. Yeah. No, and in fact, uh, Jonathan Jarsky was among several security researchers I saw today calling what Apple did very bold. They're like, this is, this, is a, this is a very brave maneuver for them because they can take some heat from law enforcement over the fact that they've essentially locked themselves out of your data 
to where they can, they can say, look, you can come with a warrant, but it is physically impossible for us to unlock these phones. Uh, so it's, it's out of our hands. Uh, and even there, there were a couple articles I read suspected that maybe they could, they could be sued by the government for uh, breaking the Kalea Act, which requires backdoors to be put into telecom equipment. I don't think that, uh, that applies to locally stored information on, on a smartphone. I think that applies more to carriers and how they operate. But who knows? In the litigious society in which we live, it's not impossible to think that the NSA could go after Apple. It would be a horrible PR move for them, but maybe they would find it worthwhile. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, um, at, but but either way, the, yeah, the the ball is definitely in the NSA's court on this one now. Uh, what about the other side of the uh, the announcement here? Because there seems to be an underlying uh, snide, and it's not even underlying actually. It's 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 writ large no, it's across pretty the page. Out there, yeah, yeah, uh, of, of of what Apple care about and what what Apple think uh, is important, which is holding on to the privacy of their users, never selling, on selling the information that you provide to an iPhone uh, for advertising. And, and, you know, it doesn't take too much to read between the lines of, of who they're going after there. No, it was almost like uh, reading an ad for Scroogled from Bing mm -hmm. uh, not too long ago. Uh, Tim Cook wrote, we don't monetize the information you store on your iPhone or an iCloud, and we don't read your email or your messages to get information to market to you. They could not pass up the opportunity to take a poke at Google as a part of what is otherwise a, a very uh, responsible, security-minded message here. And I, you know, I guess I can't blame them. These companies are are in tight competition. Apple and Google are very famously not lo no longer friends, mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't surprise me that they did that. Uh, and and they did it in a very oblique way, as you say. They didn't call anybody out by name. They said companies, which could that could mean Facebook too, e easily enough. Uh, and maybe they did mean all of those other companies. But Apple trying to point out, like, hey, we are not in the business of making money off your data, so we have no interest in seeing it. Uh, the only time we ever want to see your data is when we think it'll help you. And and the message throughout this entire site, I read most of the, the site today, was we're going to give you the ability to turn off what you're sending to iCloud more and more often. And there's a lot of things in iOS 8 that, that advance that. I mean, you can actually fine-tune the permissions on your apps now to say it can collect this information only when the app is running or it can collect the information sometimes if it's running in the background or it can never collect the information which is which is again more control and that's good Mm, absolutely, and thank God they've they finally switched on um, uh, two-factor authentica authentication. Sorry, uh, for iCloud because uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, two-factor did not a lot on uh, Apple services. So it's really really great to see that you'll be able to now go in. If you go to iCloud.com, you can go in there now and and turn on. Uh, Two-factor is needed to to access my photos, to access find my iPhone, all of those services as well. Uh, but coming back to that that Google um, that underlying Google thread in the in the story, I actually kind of feel that um, this might be the start of Apple's new um, kind of I don't know Cold War uh, fight with Google. You know, it, back in the back in the PC wars, they always yeah. had that. Um, that underlying message that hey, Macs don't get viruses, PCs get viruses, and and even if people didn't know much more about Apple computers, they could probably roll off that that statement uh, if you asked them what was the, the benefit of an Apple computer. I wouldn't be surprised if this is Apple kind of positioning themselves as, as this is their new marketing statement, or one of many marketing statements, but this is one of their kind of core tenets of what separates iOS from Android is that, look, we, we care about you, we care about your data, and we're never going to give it away. You use any other product, and you're always giving your data away. And and they're just going to go out there and give that that rallying cry to the the fanboys out there to to start these new kind of culture wars with Android. Um, Are we going to? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Actually, I hadn't thought about that. Are we going to see advertisements with a Larry Page looking character, kind of trying to steal all your data, uh, and the Apple Justin Longish character? Like, <laughs> I'm not interested in your data. You keep it. You keep it private. Yeah, yeah, we've got Justin Timberlake and uh, who's that other guy, Fallon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can do it. Yeah, right, exactly. All right, let's take a look at the calendar. Tomorrow, September 19th, is the Oculus Connect event, which will take place through September 20th in Hollywood, California. A sold-out event is taking place 
just up the block from uh, our producer Jenny's house, and she's actually really sad she can't go because the intersection of a bunch of Oculus devs and Hollywood creatives would definitely be worth checking out. Uh, instead, please enjoy this tech calendar Hollywood mashup. Tomorrow is also the Alibaba IPO. It's kind of a big deal. Alibaba has many leather-bound books, and its apartment smells of rich. <laughs> uh, finally, our... You ready for International Talk Like a Pirate Day, mateys? No? Yeah, me either, no. but get ready anyway, because uh, <laughs> it's coming. Don't study too hard, because we'll most likely kill you in the morning. See? <laughs> a good pirate reference. And on this day in 1927, the Columbia Phonograph Broadcasting System went on the air with 47 radio stations. Within two years, it would be sold and become the Columbia Broadcasting System, and later simply CBS. Notable movies inspired by CBS include The Insider, Good Night and Good Luck, and broadcast news. And also, if it weren't for CBS, Jenny and I both would have starved through parts of our careers. So there you go. Our pick of the day comes from a couple more people talking about roaming sims. Actually, Peter, I'm interested if you have an opinion on this as well. Mark Jabot pointed out no roaming. It's K-N-O-W-R-O-A-M-I-N-G.com. Uh, it's a sticker that you put over. It kind of hijacks your SIM, and it lets your SIM work normally when you're at home, but when you go overseas, you can activate it, and it gives you a connection with all of your data and your phone number and everything still active through your normal SIM. You get, he says, good rates anywhere for voice messages and data. They're not bad, although I think it was 15 cents a megabyte, so it certainly wasn't the cheapest I've seen. Uh, but you don't have to think about it in advance. You arrive at your destination, install the profile, and it works. You get back home, you remove the profile, it's done. It just switches to the strongest networks, and it's easy to use. So you might want to check it out. Uh, for those with locked phones, KO has another option. He used XCOM Global in Vancouver, and it worked great. About $15 per day, which sounds pricey, but it was the same price as hotel Wi-Fi, and all of the phones were locked, so they couldn't rent a SIM card anyway. I took a portable battery with me, so my family and I had access to the Internet all day. I was so happy that when I sent along a thank you to post it with the return device, they wrote back and gave me a 10% coupon code. Uh, he says, in Japan, I used a similar device from Global Advanced Communications, and that worked really well, too. Their coverage was good, and the speed was faster than my Comcast connection at home. I think those are rentable, uh, portable hotspots there. Uh, so check that out, xcomglobal.com. What do you use when you travel, Peter? Um, I'm always a big fan of, of uh, getting the local SIM when I travel. Um, I know it is a bit of a hassle, but um, I just kind of, you know, it, it, it's something that I put into the planning of a holiday just like I'd put into where I'm going to stay and what I'm going to do when I'm there. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of look at what are the best uh, SIM rates. Uh. I just go with those, yeah. Uh, whoa, see, they, the, uh, the VPN people got to them. That's what happened. Well, you can send your picks to feedback. No, I've had plenty. Oh, that, now you're back. There you go. Okay, there we go. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say uh, one thing to look into is sometimes the iPad sims that you can get uh, when you're traveling. So the last time I was in America, I, I grabbed a an AT and T iPad sim um, and and use that. Like generally, you ne need to kind of authenticate them first in an iPad. But once you get past that, um, if you just need data, they're they're often very very good. Oh, that's nifty. Good pick. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Caleb Andrews writes in with our message of the day. Uh, he says, like a lot of others, I'll be looking to upgrade to one of the new iPhones. My wife and I are actually looking to switch to T-Mobile. One of the things that I'm most excited in regards to the new phones is Apple Pay. I've been trying to do some digging to see whether or not when Apple Pay launches, it will be compatible with tap-to-pay NFC terminals at places like gas stations and retailers around where I live, or if it'll only be compatible with the locations that Apple indicated during their keynote last week. So far, I haven't been able to come up with a straight answer. I think this may be a question that others in a similar position are asking, so I thought I'd ask. Uh, Caleb, as I understand it, any terminal that has NFC in your location would be capable of taking part in Apple Pay, but then the retailer has to sign up with Apple Pay. So it's it's not going to be limited to just the people they made at their announcement because they said they're going to continue to develop relationships with more and more people, and a few of those have been announced since the announcement of the iPhone. But don't expect just because a place has, has NFC that they're going to take uh, Apple Pay. It's kind of early days of credit cards. I, I, I can remember back when you either had Master Charge or the Bank America card, and not mm -hmm. every place took both of them uh, like they do today. Yeah, yeah, it's um, 
it, they explained in the uh, keynote that that uh, Apple Pay would actually be a weird kind of system that that doesn't speak to the retailer exactly. So yeah, you're right. If if the NFC uh, reader is there, um, then they are capable of taking Apple Pay only then if the bank that you're using and also the retailer is on board. Yeah. Well, that is it for this episode of Daily Tech News Show. Thank you, Peter Wells. Twitter.com slash Peter Wells is the place to follow Peter, find out what he's up to. And, of course, you can find his work at reckoner.com.au. What do you all got cooking up over there these days? Uh, so a mate of mine, Anthony, has um, has pulled out the spreadsheet and gone through all of the Australian uh, iPhone deals that we have out here. Um, there's about seven different carriers, I believe, with the iPhone in Australia these days. Uh, so he's gone through them all and uh, and crunched the numbers to see what would be the best iPhone um, deal that you can get. Uh, and looking at it on a very nerdy uh, perspective, so he only looks at 4G plans and he only looks at plans where you could easily break the contract if you wanted to get a new phone later, because um, that's the kind of guy he is. But yeah, if you are a nerd and you like updating your device quite a bit, um, that would be something to check out. Um, I, I'd also say just quickly, uh, uh, if you are a stats nerd or if you're a network nerd, um, the iPhone update day is always our biggest day at the university I work at. So uh, last year uh, we, we clocked over 12 terabytes in a day on our network. Um, so this year I'm hoping to beat that, so I'll be tweeting the uh, um, all of the stats of our, our network and how the fact it didn't melt down yesterday, which is pretty cool. I'm hoping iOS 8 beat iOS 7, but yeah, if you're a stats nerd, you like that kind of stuff, follow me for some pretty graphs throughout the day. Well, yeah, just imagine all of those thousands of students all trying to grab iOS 8 all at the same time. It makes perfect sense that you'd, you'd clock huge amounts of bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, so so that so follow uh, Peter on Twitter. Keep keep abreast of that kind of stuff. Twitter.com slash Peter Wells. Thanks to our patrons, 4,280 of you folks out there. Make this show possible. Uh, it, we have a value for value proposition. Uh, I can afford to, to record this locally to my hard drive for free, and I probably will. But, but it's possible to distribute it even farther. Uh, if you find some value in the show and you can give a little value back, we really, truly appreciate it. Uh, if you want to find out more about the options to do that, dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate. And thank you to those who do. And even thank you if you can't and you're just out there telling folks about us. That helps us out quite a bit as well. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Our phone number is 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. You can listen to the show live at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific at mobile.alphageekradio.com Monday through Friday. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Tomorrow, Eck from Hockey Buzz will join us with his new iPhone 6 as well as Darren Kitchen and Len Peralta illustrating the show. See you then. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. That's it. Well done. Hey. Good show, man. Thank you, thank you. Thank uh, you. I was going to uh, mention one other plug, but it would make no sense to a tech audience. But, okay, there's only three games left in the Australian Football League. You uh -huh. have to start watching. It's, 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 it's been an amazing year. It's just been fantastic. Uh, really and I looked up... Here. Yeah, yeah, well, I looked it up. There is, uh, there's a pub in Santa Monica that is playing um, the grand final next week. Uh, and if all goes well, then the Sydney Swans uh, will be in the, the grand final and... Uh, that should be an amazing game. What's the pub? Uh, it is the Cock and Bull in Santa Monica. Of course. Okay, I know where that is. Yes, yes. As you know, the, the swan is the most ferocious of the animal kingdom. Uh, so uh, it, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing my, my mighty Sydney swans uh, take on... Yeah, God, I, th I think it's going to be the hawks. But anyway. <laughs> awesome. Satanta right. has it still. Wow, Satanta's still around? Cool. So Tanta's expensive though. That's why you gotta go to a pub. Yep. Um, so would you like some titles? Sure. What do we got? <laughs> we got some good ones today. Uh, we've got many three way three vote tie of paper whitier. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix leaves the back door open. Yeah. Uh, Dirty Deeds Done Down Under. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you can take the Netflix for my cold dead router. Awesome. 
Yeah, and then uh, when we get down, there was one that was my favorite that was like a little further down. I actually really love Ellison Leaves Oracle to Herd Cats. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it has to be K because her name is, uh, so for cats, his name is K, but he he is. He's leaving Oracle to Herd Cats. Uh-huh. Um, and then the one I liked that was further down was Canary in a Cloud Mine. Mm, because it, right, because of the Warren Canary. It's a beautiful title. Clever. Mm. Yeah. Puts the police in my head. Yeah. It just it has the, the a touch of the poetry. And I don't mean the NSA when I say the police. <laughs> I mean yeah. the band. The other police. The faux reggae yeah. band. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably my favorite. Uh although All right, uh, showbot.replex.org. Yes. Make your voice known. We don't just pick the one with the most votes, but it does help us break ties in our head. Well, there are a lot of good ones here today. Yeah. Touch of the poet. Um, I. Oh, Peter Wells, what, does the weekend hold anything exciting for you? Well, yeah, yeah. I've got the uh, Swans game tonight. Uh, so oh, Swans right. North Melbourne, okay. And I've got a friend from Melbourne flying up. Actual game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's that we're looking to have I think eighty-two thousand uh, seats oh. sold so far. Wow. So, so do you do you play it in the Olympic Stadium? Is that where they play? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. The old okay. Olympic Stadium. Yeah, I've been there. Mm, mm, that's right. Yeah, you were down here for your honeymoon, I believe. Yeah, I saw the 2003 World Cup semifinals between the All Blacks and the Wallabies. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Mm. At that stadium, Tel- Telstra Stadium, right? Or is what it was uh, then? It's, you know, it's changed hands about eight times since then. It's <laughs> ANZ Stadium these days, but but yeah. it's the it's that same one. Yeah, that big giant one. Yeah. Yep. What's it called now? Uh, ANZ Stadium. ANZ. Oh, well, that's very cross the pond-ish, cross the ditch of them. <laughs> uh, it's just a multinational bank. <laughs> oh, is that what? It's a bank. I didn't realize that was a bank. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Only banks and telcos can afford to name uh, stadiums in this yeah. country. Mm-hmm. Anywho, I should go to work, but thank you All guys. Right, that was fun. Yeah, thanks for doing that, as always. Uh, really appreciate you getting up early, man. Yeah. Bye, Peter. Thank you. Bye. All right. It is now title time. What do we got? Um, let me look. Ellison is leading. Canary in a cloud mine second. Yeah. Paper white ear third. I missed the paper white ear. How did I miss that? That was when I was talking about the Kindle, and I was saying oh, that the yeah, 300 yeah. PPI in the Voyage would make made it even paper whitier than the paper white. <laughs> um, I think we can I go like, with Canary. Yeah, it's just very evocative of what you were actually talking about today. And it is the main topic too. Yeah, Tonda Gasa. Let's see. So poetic. I'm putting it right here. Today's headlines. Suddenly, I was overwhelmed with a desire for Montreal-style bagels. Can you get those here? I don't think you can. I haven't looked, but you can't really get them almost anywhere outside of Montreal. And it's one of those things that even if you could get them here, they wouldn't be the same because it's it's the water. Hmm. Yeah. Well... I'm pretty much only ever going to pimp for New York bagels. <laughs> well, it's I'm not saying Montreal bagels are the best bagels. I'm saying that I just had a craving for that kind of bagel. So mm. I just want could they cuz they are really good. They're tiny. They're small. Remember mini pizza bagels? Did you ever have those at any school of higher education that you went to? Are you saying when when Remember pizza bagels, but then you'd yes. have mini pizza bagels and and tater tots, and that would somehow count as a meal. <laughs> or were you always a healthy eater? No. Okay. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> when pizza's on a bagel. Yeah. We never had pizza bagels in school. It sounded like you're saying. I did. Cafeteria. I had pizza bagels in school, uh, in my middle school, and uh, tater tots in high school were like the mainstays. Uh, yeah, we had tater tots, tater tots covered in plastic, <laughs> called cheese. 
right. we had the square pizzas, which were like a cracker mm-hmm. covered in ketchup, covered in cheese, Aww. and then cut into squares. When I say a cracker, it wasn't like a saltine cracker, but it was like a cracker crust. Yeah. Um, and then uh, macaroni and cheese, which was macaroni covered in plastic. <laughs> and we <laughs> so called them soy saying? burgers <laughs> because you could see the soybeans in the burger. Oh. Like, yeah. God, I hope they were really soybeans. <laughs> um, let's see what we got. Yeah, right. Not some other substance. Uh, the Verge cast went live again today. Yeah. At, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. All right. So, There's only so many hours in a day. They're in our space. <laughs> We're on demand. You can get us whenever you want. <laughs> I think you can here, too. We know that people will make the right decision. Oh, deep fried burritos, TVZ Gun points out. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought a burrito was growing up because we never had burritos at home. There were no yeah. burrito places in Greenville. And so the only burrito I ever had was the school burrito. And then when I found <laughs> out what a burrito really was, I was shocked. I was like, oh, they can be good? That's amazing. <laughs> I thought burrito was synonymous for disgusting. Yes. I thought it meant like dry, disgusting, over-fried thing with something resembling beef smeared inside. Yeah. But no, they could be delicious. Wow. They took me going to college to learn that. Well, that was worth a collegiate education. Exactly. That's what I got out of my University of Illinois education. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the best burrito, one of the best burritos I've ever had still in my life was in Cicero, Illinois, suburb of Chicago, on a on a trip mm. up to Chicago with some friends in, in college, like my freshman or sophomore mm. year. Hey, we're tied. We tied it up at the top of Showbot. Herd cats. You, gotta, <laughs> you know, you just got to get a hand at the CS 803. He brings it. Mm-hmm. On a regular basis. Yeah, it's, it's consistency that you have to admire. Uh, did you enjoy doing Ron Burgundy today? <laughs> Thank you, yes. It was good. You, you, you committed. It was good. Did it work? I was, yeah. afraid, I was afraid I wasn't committing enough. No, it was a good level of commitment. Yeah, because like, I didn't want to overdo it. It was good. Um, I'm was, I was having trouble finding the line. <laughs> no, the just the 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 pause, the the pregnant pause before. Good. Okay. The, you know, like the final one. That was good. That was just good, enough. Good. All right. Well done. Thanks. I was gonna make you do like six broadcast news quotes in a row, and then I was like, <laughs> no, that'll make the show run really long. <laughs> yeah, we ran. Well, we didn't run that long. A couple minutes. No, but- it would have run longer. I yeah. love broad- that broadcast news. May be my favorite movie of all time, hands down. If I really I, had to pick one. I, I saw that in pieces. I think I've seen the whole thing, but I don't think I ever saw it all in one stretch. Was the problem? Yeah, it is just spectacular. I used to have. <laughs> I used to have like just the IMDb printout of all the quotes, the notes oh, yeah. from broadcast news, papering my cubicle, like uh, six different printouts of it, just papering. Nice. Because it was such sharp writing, and also being true. Let's see what else? Got my show notes all ready to go. Like a good producer. So I haven't settled on final locations for files, but I know some people had a problems with the audio. So a lot of people got it fine, but some people I guess got to it late and it was yeah. it was glitching out. So we'll we'll figure that out soon. Hmm. Christmas says, what do you think of the iPhone 6? Um, I, I've, I've covered that, Christmas. You just missed it, I guess. Um, I think it's fine. I think it's a good phone. I don't think it's worth the crazy response that it's getting. Uh, but it's but it's a nice phone. Um, I will give my thoughts more on it once I have one in my hands. But tomorrow, Eck is joining the show specifically because he, he got one that will be delivered tomorrow. And if all goes well... 
he should get his before the show and be able to like talk about his impressions uh, directly. Mm-hmm. But I don't really, I'll be honest, I just don't really care about it all that much. I don't, and I don't mean that to be like anti-Apple or hateful or anything. I just feel like it's just another good phone out there. And if you're in the iPhone universe, there's no reason to leave. This phone is good, and it adds some some excellent things. I'm very encouraged by this privacy policy update. It's not perfect, but it's a it's a great step. Uh, on the other hand, I it's not the kind of thing that inspired me to fight to make sure that I get it on day one because uh, I just think it's, you know, it's the normal stair step of like, okay, it's got a bigger screen, it's got NFC, and the NFC is all locked down and can only do one thing. There's, that's fine. You know, there's a lot of things that it does that Android phones have done for a long time, but the whole pitch with Apple is, yes, but we do these better. And until we can road test that for a few weeks, we won't really know if that's true. There's no reason to think it won't be, though. I uh, think I'm going to save my money for a 3D printer and an Oculus Rift headset. Yeah. That's my, that's the future. Or a ticket to space. I went ahead and ordered a 6, not a 6 Plus, yeah. uh, because I just, Eileen convinced me. She's like, you just need to be able to talk about it, yeah. you know. Uh, and she's like, you have a Nexus 7, and I know you have an iPad, but there's enough difference between the 5 and the 6 uh, that it's worth getting. So. Yeah. What do you uh, what do you do with all these phones? Well, I have done lots of different things. I've either I've given some to friends. I've sold some at a garage sale. I sold them to um, uh, Gazelle, and I'm thinking I'll probably give this one to my mom because she's mm. on a four, mm. and it can't even get iOS eight. It's yeah. It's old. Um, yeah, I just. Uh... I'm ready for the big leap. Did you see that article? I don't know if it came out today, but it was in New York Magazine about this big, long article about Silicon Valley contract workers, which was very good. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull it up again. What do you all got cooking up over there? All right. I believe it's time to give my sad... I'm out of the post. Oh. There was someone. Uh, who was it yeah. on uh, on Twitter? It was um. Who was it? Two cows. Two cows. Sorry, two cows, but I am out of the post. Apologies. It happens. It happens every day. No, waffle off. I guess it was me that was talking about going Moto X, uh, and I'm still. I still might go two phone. Middle Creek's like, shouldn't she be pushing you to use Google products? Well, yeah, exactly. That's that's why it was so compelling when she told me to get it. I'm like, well, this is you speaking objectively then. No, well, it's it's you. It's a good wife speaking about her husband's job. Exactly. Rather than making a judgment about the phones, I just saved your wife's job. <laughs> <Not even. laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, it's a little PR firm that could. Okay. I'll All right. I'm updating my part of the post. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.